Hello, I'm Karen Purnell. I'm joined by my co-producer, Jake Gable. In our series of podcasts for the Year 2 journalism students at University of Winchester on the history and context of journalism, I'm joined today with Chris Horry, who earlier on gave a lecture on the three great sceptics in the history of ideas. They were Marx, Nietzsche and Freud and their move to radical subjectivity. So Chris, uh, would you like just to explain the main points of your lecture today? Yes, well by subjectivity it's a position in in relation to epistemology which is um, the philosophical term for the attempt to understand how we understand things, where does knowledge come from and so on. Now in this series we, we've uh, we start off by talking about the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment project and that is based on really a kind of quite objectivist um, epistemology the idea that there are objects in the world that they exist independently of uh, any particular person's consciousness so if we all died for example the universe would continue to exist and so on that's really a kind of objective scientific view that was dominant in European thought still is largely um, and is really pretty near the core of what we think of as the Enlightenment and the, and the scientific revolution of the past two or three hundred years. Um, but there, there, there were sort of trends within the Enlightenment that were sort of eating it away uh, internally, elements of doubt. Uh, and finally towards the end of the 19th century you get this great move in philosophy, culture, the arts, literature, towards uh, a kind of much more subjective approach. The idea that the uh, the idea of universal laws of science, for example, to be replaced by subjective impressions. So instead of universal truths about things, there is subjective truth. There's my truth, there's your truth. So for in, in various ways, in different ways, uh, from Karl Marx, from Friedrich Nietzsche and Sigmund Freud, what is true is largely a matter of perspective. You know, I am right from my side, you are right from yours, that we can observe the same phenomena or social phenomena. Uh, but a woman, for example, to take uh, radical subjectivism a bit further into modern times in feminism, that there might even be so something like female consciousness that differs from men's consciousness, and there might be black consciousness or student consciousness or gay consciousness and that this is an assertion that the truth of any matter is depends upon where we're coming from depends from the perspective rather than some objective universal scientific law which uh, the the uh, endeavor of the enlightenment re was was really there to try and uncover Okay, the first philosopher that uh, you've mentioned is Marx. Can you tell us what kind of impact he had? on uh, radical subjectivity. Right, well, f from Marx we get two very important ideas in, in contemporary intellectual life, which are, is alienation um, and um, ideology. Both of these very compatible with Nietzsche and Freud. Uh, I'm not going to, we did, didn't discuss in the lecture Marx's economics. Uh, we, we looked at Karl Marx, or even his politics, the Communist Manifesto and so on. Um, we've looked at that under a previous heading. So I was mainly interested in his book, The German Ideology, and the great phrase from that is, um, the ruling ideas in any epoch are the ideas of the ruling class. So whatever we think is right and sensible and just common sense for Karl Marx isn't some sort of universal common sense. It's that those ideas are the ideas of the people in positions of power. So in ancient Greece, for example, it was thought that women were just failed men. Aristotle thought that women were just biologically f mutant men, you know, that they should have no rights and they were kind of inferior people. Um, now And now we think that women should be equal with men and in some ways they're superior to men. Now, from Marx's point of view in the German ideology, that is neither of these things is objectively true they are the subjective truths of the people who happen to be in positions of power so from the german ideology and the marxist idea of ideology you, you that is very corrosive of the enlightenment idea of universal laws so if you take a, a classic artifact of the enlightenment such as the american constitution which starts by saying we hold these truths to be self-evident 
that all men are born with certain inalienable rights. Well, Karl Marx is going to say, well, no. What about black people? They they had no rights. I mean, you were just you know you, that just happened to suit the colonists and and the um, ex colonists who set up the United States, many of whom were slave owners, for example. So that tendency uh, w within uh, educated discourse from Karl Marx of ideology is very very important in corroding the Enlightenment project. Uh, the second one is alienation, the idea that we are not in control of our own lives. Uh, in Marxist terms, that's we have to earn a living, for example. We're no longer natural beings like apes who feed themselves and look after themselves. We're not even free tribal people who, who just do subsistence farming. We're highly alienated people. We sell our labour and do very abstract things in return for wages. So we have no control over our lives ultimately. We are dependent upon somebody to employ us, somebody to house us and clothe us. We couldn't do that ourselves. So the idea of alienation in social terms, that's highly compatible, of course, with with Freud's idea of uh, um, that, that one is not in control of one's personality, that there is a subconscious, etc. So Marx is saying there in his, uh, well, actually, in, he puts it most clearly in his economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844 that in what he calls capitalist society um, people are not whole there is part of their lives that is disconnected and this is a source of great unhappiness and that's very similar to the Freudian idea that people are not in charge of their subconscious and this is the cause of unhappiness as well I'd like to talk about Friedrich Nietzsche because after studying this course he was a very influential figure and he's famous for the words God is dead. Um, can you just explain what he meant by that? Well the full quote is God is dead and we have killed him and it comes from a, a phase in one of his books called The Parable of the Madman um, and in The Parable of the Madman a, a fictional character is going around town and you've got to imagine this happening in Winchester or London now, going up to people and saying, where's God? Have you seen God recently? Have you been involved with God recently? And everybody simply thinks this man is utterly insane because n the contention is that no educated person, at least, or no non-superstitious person, um, no healthy non-superstitious person would believe in a disembodied objective entity such as God which created the universe and controlled it because Nietzsche's subjectivism is much more powerful even than Marx um, and it, Nietzsche came before Freud so in some ways Freud's subjective idea um, that everything that we know is filtered through the subconscious etc um, is is much more similar to, to um, Nietzsche's very deep subjectivism. So morality for, for um, Nietzsche is a purely personal matter. Um, what is evil, he says, is whatever I disapprove of. What is good is whatever I happen to approve of. It does not come from God. So God's role as a kind of universal guarantor of morality that all humanity would always regard cannibalism, for example, as evil and, and always regard murder as evil and always regard charity as good. Uh, that collapses, um, Nietzsche says, partly under the impact of anthropology, that towards the end of the 19th century there's a new science, a new ology we haven't really dealt with yet, which is anthropology, which is the systematic study of different cultures around the world, radically different cultures such as the Amazon rainforest people and the Australian Aborigines and the bush people of the Kalahari and so on, nomadic herds people of Central Asia. And these people tend to have radically different moral systems. You know, cannibalism is a good example which is given not by Nietzsche but by, by uh, Fraser, another very important thing from this kind of period. Cannibalism is absolutely forbidden and seen as evil and incredibly deviant and really bad in our culture. Think of Sinus of the Lambs, you know, Hannibal Lecter, it's like a symbol of everything that's evil. But there are some cultures where cannibalism is celebrated. It's a religious rite um, for disposal of the dead. So all morals are, are relative to him and subjective. Again, 
if I, you know, what is good or e good and appropriate for me may not be good and appropriate for you. There are no universal standards of good or bad. He's a radical subjectivist. His morality is a relativist. Okay, and um, we spoke about Freud in our previous podcast, um, and we discussed, obviously, his uh, three types of subconscious. Um, how is he considered to be one of the three great sceptics? Well, he too is undermining the central idea from the Enlightenment that there is first... Well, the Enlightenment's about individuals. It's the idea that each person is a self-contained entity responsible for their actions and uh, ha having naturally certain rights. Again, it's there in the American Constitution that um, every person has the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and that's such a central idea. I mean, it's the central idea of the Western world's legal system, for example. Marx says, no, these, these laws are not universal and they're not self-evident. They're just what happens to suit the ruling group in the American colonies. Nietzsche is saying, this is hypocrisy. You know, these people, again, are defining what is good just as what is good for them. What's good for them was not good for the North American Indians. It meant genocide for them. Um, and also for Freud, well, the, the self-contained individual who can be held responsible for their actions, um, who can be criticised for making poor decisions uh, as a, as in society, is also uh, undermined. So these three thinkers, and we've really just, we've not entirely dealt with Nietzsche today, we'll perhaps come back to him, uh, some of his other very important thoughts. Um, but all these three people are saying, ultimately, they're saying there are no individuals. And insofar as moral values are expressed, they are relative, they are temporary, and they are entirely to do with the perspective of the person who is asserting those morals. Okay, thank you very much for joining me today, Chris, and thank you to my co-producer, Jake. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, but we will have more podcasts coming soon on the history and context of journalism for students at the University of Winchester. Thank you.